Just making sure, Sarah, the live stream has begun. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Sarah. A yes, you're live. Gay internet. Makes it sound so scary. <laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the May 31st meeting of Brooklyn Community Board 14's Community Environment, Cultural Affairs, and Economic Development Committee. Uh, I am one of your co-chairs tonight. My name is Dwayne Joseph. Uh, I'm here with my fellow uh, board member and co-chair, Barton Persan. Uh, we are joined by uh, members of the community, our board chair, um, Joanne Brown, and our district office team led by uh, Sean Campbell. Um, tonight, um, we'll be hearing uh, from three groups presenting on three different uh, topics uh, with rel relative importance to our community. Uh, first uh, up will be the um, a representative from the Office of Technology and Innovation. I believe that's the new name, formerly Do It. Um, so the New York City Office of Technology and Innovation will be providing us with a report uh, on the New York City policy regarding installation of 5G networks. Uh, that will be followed by a presentation from Julie Chu from uh, the Public Bathroom Task Force um, that's expanding access to public restrooms. And finally, uh, representatives from the Parks Department uh, and the Prospect Park Alliance regarding the update on the Shirley Chisholm Monument at the uh, Prospect Park um, Parkside entrance, that's the southeast entrance of uh, Prospect Park. Uh, so um, without uh, further ado, uh, or actually let's set some, some ground rules for tonight. Uh, while folks are presenting, please allow them to present in full. Uh, there will be an opportunity after each presentation for uh, board members to ask questions, then the uh, residents of Community Board 14, and then other interested parties. Uh, if we do not have an opportunity to get to your question, or you want to make a statement, please email our board office and we'll make sure that that question or statement gets recorded into the official record. And hopefully, um, depending on who that question or statement is um, directed to, if there's need for feedback, uh, the appropriate party will respond and we can get that information out to you. So uh, I would just ask the board team if you can just put our contact information in the chat uh, at some point during the meeting so people uh, that are interested uh, know where to send their uh, comments or questions. All right, um, so with that, um, we will get started. Stacy, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Dwayne. Nice to meet you. Um, thank you guys for inviting us tonight. Um, my name is Stacy Gardner. I'm the Senior Director of External Affairs for the Office of Technology and Innovation. Uh, we have been uh, rebranded, uh, used to be Do It. Now we're one big happy tech family under one name. Um, with me is my colleague, Brett Sykoff. He is the Executive Director for Franchise Administration and his team oversees um, the Link NYC franchise. And um, <clears throat> I also have um, Nick Holvin from City Bridge. City Bridge is the company that is the franchisee that uh, deploys and operates Link NYC. So they're not the city entity, but um, Nick is going to provide um, the presentation tonight, a quick one. Uh, obviously, you guys have a lot of um, a lot of stuff to get to tonight, so don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I'll just give a very quick overview and then I'll, I'll kick it off to Nick. Um, you know, I, obviously you guys are familiar with Link NYC. There are a number of them in your district already. Um, it's the program to uh, basically t turn the old payphone into uh, a more modern structure. Um, which is uh, in its current form in your district, um, uh, Link NYC kiosks that have free Wi-Fi, free calling, device charging, um, access to social services and 911, 311, um, and uh, ad panels that um, provide community messaging uh, as well. Um, 
so we have been rolling out a new version of the Link NYC kiosk, which is called Link 5G. Um, it is a taller structure. Um, the reason for this is to accommodate mobile telecommunications infrastructure. What that is, is basically the antennas that power the cellular service that you have come to rely on as you are making your way through the city and also inside your home. Um, so all of the, the cellular service that you have is currently powered by uh, such signals. Um, and in order for those networks to be as robust as possible, um, physical infrastructure must uh, be present. Um, right now, that's in the form mostly of either rooftop antennas or attachments to street poles, um, such as uh, street lights, traffic lights, utility poles. Um, we also oversee that franchise. Um, but Link 5G is meant to kind of take, um, you know, a, an innovative approach to adding more spots for that infrastructure to go. Um, in addition to all the services you've come to um, rely on from the Link MIC kiosks. Um, and it's a multi-tenant structure, so that means that um, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, all of those companies can put their equipment in one pole instead of maybe, you know, there, there might be a, a segment of a block where T-Mobile has all of their infrastructure on single tenant structures. Uh, not so much the others, you might have a gap in service there. So um, this is meant to really um, make it so that no matter what your carrier is, um, there is an opportunity for those companies to expand their networks um, in a given area. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll turn it right over to Nick. You can give, you have more visuals and, and you can give a, a, a bigger overview of the program as a whole. Sorry, I was trying to prepare my screen share and I realized I can't unmute and do that at the same time. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for having us here. I appreciate the opportunity. As Stacy said, uh, I'm the CEO of CityBridge, um, the consortium behind the Lincoln NYC program and partner with the city on it. I will provide a, a brief overview, as Stacy said as well, of the program and of Link 5G. Uh, and of course, happy to, to answer questions. And let's see if I can make this share work. Um, okay, and can you see that? Yes. And is it full screen for you? Yes. Great. Um, I can no longer see you because I have just one monitor here, but I'm glad you can see it. Um, so Lincoln NYC, um, you know, the, the purpose behind the program fundamentally is to provide free and equitable access to connectivity information and wireless services. Um, as Stacey had said, originally envisioned and still really envisioned as a replacement for the old uh, antiquated payphone infrastructure that uh, used to litter the sidewalks of the city. I think we used to have, uh, when we started the program, a little over 8,000 of those. At one point, I believe there was 20 to 25,000 in the city. Uh, today, there are zero. Um, instead, we have roughly 2,000 um, of the Lincoln NYC kiosks deployed. Um, most of those are the original uh, version you see on the right here. Um, and about 100 of the Link 5Gs have been uh, deployed so far. Uh, Link NYC provides um, free Wi-Fi, very high speed, uh, gigabit class Wi-Fi, free uh, nationwide digital calling, um, a, a 911 button for fast access to emergency services. Um, we provide uh, device charging uh, on the front for, for mobile devices. And we have ad displays, uh, or I should say content displays on the side that display advertising, which provides revenue to support the program uh, and also uh, a revenue share to the city, uh, as well as PSAs um, uh, published by the city or by our partners and the community. We provide free access to nonprofits, uh, community groups, uh, community boards. Um, I'm not sure if you all have, have availed yourselves, but um, many community boards in the city do use our screens as well, and, and we're happy to, uh, to provide that service. And also say that all of the services available on the tablet, the, the phone calling, telecommunications, et cetera, are accessible to the, the blind uh, and the deaf hard of hearing um, through various applications and, and services. Um, so, 
you know, the digital divide in New York, just to say really quickly and, and, and help everyone maybe understand the, the reason and the urgency behind the program, you know, roughly uh, 3 million people in the city either lack mobile broadband, lack home broadband, or lack both mobile and home broadband, meaning they have no access to the internet uh, on their own. Um, that's larger than, than many cities' total population. Um, these numbers are, are improving, um, but they're not really improving fast enough. Furthermore, uh, there's a real need for better cellular service in the city. Uh, we uh, you know, uh, commissioned a survey from a third party um, research company last year to ask New Yorkers about uh, the quality of the cellular service and the quality of the internet. And what we found was that generally throughout the city, um, there is a, an experience of, of poor service quality at, um, at times and sometimes persistently where people live. And that in uh, the outer boroughs and, and equity areas, what we call digital deserts, um, where the, the deployment is uh, focused, uh, there, there's a higher um, likelihood of poor service and a higher reliance on mobile telecommunications as well. Um, so, you know, we're just really driving home the, the need for improved cellular infrastructure and also the alignment of, of this program with Link 5G being focused above 96th Street and in the outer boroughs um, and targeting specifically areas um, with uh, a lack of historic investment in telecommunication services. Uh, so as part of this new program, we designed a new kiosk that's that's focused on telecommunications. On the left, you see the original kiosk. On the right, um, the lower part of the Flink 5G kiosk designed by the same uh, industrial design firm that designed the original kiosk to, to match the look and feel. It has all the same services of the original kiosk, but also provides uh, facilities to support uh, 5G cellular connectivity in addition to the Wi-Fi and everything else. Um, so just to say a little bit about the progression of cellular service and, and why uh, we're talking about this type of infrastructure and, and pole tops are, are being deployed more and more. So you know, back in the early days of cellular, back in the 80s, uh, there weren't a lot of users. Uh, you were able to uh, put up one radio on a, what's called a macro tower, things that you see on the side of the interstate maybe. Um, or on the top of a mountain um, when you're out in you know, uh, more remote areas. Uh, and those macro towers cover large areas, like many square miles can be covered um, by one of those macro towers. As more people you know, began using cell phones and as people started using it for data and not just uh, voice services, um, more radios needed to be deployed to support more people using them. Um, so you saw more macro towers closer together, maybe smaller towers. In New York City, you see this on the, the tops of buildings um, to, to support uh, you know, a higher density of radios and more users. And now, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, um, really since the advent of smartphones, the iPhone, and the, the rapid adoption of those, um, and really the, the always-on connectivity that people expect, just a rapid rise in the use um, and, and the, the prevalence of use of mobile devices and the demand on, of each user for data. And that's requiring that even more radios be deployed and closer together and closer to the people that are using them. So these are the small cells that you see in this image. And that this is what that looks like, a macro tower on the left, on the right, uh, a rooftop deployment, much like you would see uh, throughout New York City. And then Stacy mentioned, um, you have the, the pole tops. Um, so certain light poles, specifically the light poles that, that look like the one on the left here, you can install uh, one cellular radio supporting one, you know, one carrier, one type of service. On top of this, and on the right, we now have the Link 5G, which is the same height as a, a street pole with a with a uh, cellular small cell sighting on top of it, um, but because it's been designed from the ground up, uh, it supports not just one carrier uh, and radio, but um, up to, to four different uh, radios. All of the carriers can use the structure at once, and uh, the, the 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 pole part of the structure is actually a network cabinet, so you can um, put radios within the pole, and those can can be utilized to, to share different frequencies in, in one antenna at the top. So it's a little technical, but the point here is that the entire structure is designed to facilitate wireless telecommunications infrastructure on the same uh, sidewalk real estate that one of those um, street poles uh, consumes. And much less real estate, I should say, than, than pay phones uh, consume. They're much smaller in terms of the footprint. Um, so you know, in addition to being this purpose-built wireless telecommunications infrastructure, um, you know, the, one of the, the other benefits to the community is that there's less uh, utility construction required to install the same number of radios. So once you install Link 5G, you can add radios without digging up the street again. 
whereas additional pole top deployments require new trenching and new disruption for every installation. Uh, and it's the only piece of infrastructure, um, whether it's uh, you know on the sidewalk or on a building top or anywhere else, that brings along with it the digital safety net of free Wi-Fi, phone calling, emergency services, et cetera. Um, and it's really, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not taking up new uh, real estate on the sidewalks. It's replacing old payphone uh, sidewalk real estate at a much smaller footprint and a smaller quantity. Um, so we're really getting back sidewalk real estate in exchange for um, a much denser and optimized wireless telecommunications deployment. Uh, we get a lot of questions about like the design and, you know, can it be smaller? Can, you know, what do other cities do? Uh, the reality is in other cities, you see taller poles, generally speaking, and often fewer services on each pole. Um, so more typically, where ours is 32 feet, you'll see a 40 to 50 foot tall structure uh, in other cities. And, you know, another thing just to, to drive the point home, uh, on, the, on other infrastructure, you typically will get just one technology deployed. On a link 5G, you can support the ultra fast 5G, what's called millimeter wave, um, very close to the structure. You also have the very fast Wi-Fi, which is free and open to the public. Um, and then other bands of 5G that you might typically associate with 4G, which are upgraded to, to support 5G and can go much further from the structure. So it, it doesn't just affect service around the structure, but can affect service in buildings and you know, several blocks away from the structure as well. Um, and to mention siting, we get a lot of questions about where these can be placed. Um, so one important point is the, the advertising screen version can't be placed uh, in residential areas, nor uh, on the sidewalk in front of uh, a first floor residence, even if it happens to be in a commercial area. Um, only one link 5G may be installed on any given block on either side of the street. Uh, and regardless of the block that it's on, no link 5G can be less than 200 feet from another link 5G. So you, you really, um, we aren't allowed to deploy this close to each other. And frankly, there wouldn't be a need to. We would probably, generally speaking, any two link 5G that you could see from the other would be even further away from each other than that to optimize for the coverage of each, each location. Uh, and then finally, the uh, deployment in areas outside of commercial um, zones, um, at, you know, or I should say outside of sort of standard zoning, uh, adjacent to parks uh, in historic districts, um, certain districts that are governed by city planning, um, they require additional approval. So there's a, a lot of different regulatory uh, approvals that must be, be passed through uh, before a, a site is approved. And, and one of those steps, um, which I don't have reflected on a slide, is um, community review uh, of sites. So every every new Link 5G um, is, is sent for review um, by community boards and borough presidents and, and council members to get feedback from the community on uh, the sites that are being proposed. Um, and, and then one, one final point I'll make, um, just so it's, it's clear, you know, it's not just the infrastructure above the sidewalk um, that we're installing to support each link 5G. There's a new fiber backbone that's being deployed uh, underneath the street. And um, this fiber is, is deployed in bundles. So there's fiber to support link 5G. There's also additional fiber and what's called a neutral infrastructure that can be utilized by other service providers to provide in-home or uh, business uh, fiber service um, or any other type of internet service in, in a given community. Uh, and this is also a really important aspect of this and the focus outside of core Manhattan, um, where this fiber infrastructure has generally been un under deployed. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's not just bringing a new investment above ground, but also new investment below ground uh, to support um, you know, economic growth and, and digital connectivity uh, throughout the city. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I think, you know, we did want to mention, uh, Stacey, if you want to say anything about, about this, but um, there is uh, there are a few sites in CB14 um, that you know, there's many that are already live and there's three um, that are pending a completion of other uh, regulatory review before they're installed. Um, can you all see the map? Yes. OK, great. So in green, we have um, the existing uh, deployed structures and in red, there's three proposed um, or I should say planned sites that are still wending their way through um, through regulatory approval before they they are um, finally uh, installed, which you know would probably be several months from now at the soonest. Um, so uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll stop there um, and uh, offer offer myself. Um, or, or anyone else, if you have any questions, please, please do ask.
And I'm gonna try to find my way back to the WebEx window. So thank you so much for that, that presentation, Nick. Um, I just wanna just preface our, our um, feedback session by saying, um, in the interest of time, uh, we wanna limit questions to uh, two minutes. Um, and if you have additional, again, like I said in the beginning, if you have additional questions or statements uh, that aren't directly answered here tonight, please forward that information to our board office and we will do our best to um, have the appropriate party responsibility in a timely manner. Uh, with that, I want to uh, begin our, our feedback session with um, questions from uh, board members. Uh, Glenn Mullen and then Corazon Valiente. Thank you very much. <clears throat> nice presentation, but I do have two questions. Uh, my understanding of 5G is that the signal doesn't penetrate very well, but you seem to have a secondary signal. Is, is that penetrating into buildings much better? And the second part of the question is uh, uh, your location is a rather tight corridor. Uh, Brooklyn is a really big place, and I'm wondering if there are other installations planned. Thank you. Sure. And just if I could clarify, when you say it's a tight quarter, you're referring to the existing deployment being sort of lo located along Flatbush Avenue? Primarily? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah. So what you showed on the map, right? It's just yeah. like one run, but, you know, yes. So yep. uh, understood. OK, so the I think the um, the difference So earlier in the deployment, when we were focused on that smaller structure, there was a real priority and emphasis placed on replacing payphones um, with them. And so there, most of those sites were selected because that's where payphones used to be. Um, there was also a focus on speed of deployment. And so we tended to travel along quarters and try to fill out payphone, uh, X payphone sites in those areas. So those, those green sites that I showed, those are all existing Link 1.0 sites, um, the old style structure. The, the three new sites are Link 5G and they're more geographically dispersed. And those are really going to be cited uh, henceforth in a more dispersed fashion and focused in, on um, optimizing for the uh, RF transmission or the, really the, the coverage provided by the structures um, versus simply swapping out pay phones. So uh, acknowledge that um, as you saw in Flatbush and in a lot of areas of the city, the older units were deployed more densely um, and along corridors um, where there's a lot of foot traffic, which is as the old payphones were deployed, Link 5G is not going to be focused in that style of, uh, of dense deployment along a given avenue. And that's not to say that they won't be, um, you, know, you know, a few blocks away from each other on any given street because, you know, you tend to see more demand where there are more people. So heavier trafficked areas will probably um, receive more structures, but um, that is to say they won't be anywhere nearly as dense as the old ones. To answer your question about um, 5G, um, it's confusing because um, the carriers don't do a great job of differentiating this, but 5G, um, what people associate with 5G as the millimeter wave, the ultra fast, ultra wideband, it's called service. You're right, that does not propagate very far. Um, you know, we'll estimate like 500 feet, it can go further, but you're also right in that it doesn't uh, penetrate um, really anything very well. Uh, it doesn't reflect off of surfaces um, the way Wi-Fi or other lower frequency um, bands do. Um, so, uh, you know, that's true of that very fast service, but 5G is really um, the entire sort of ecosystem of, of radios and frequencies that are utilized. And it allows a cell phone, which, you know, met, used to have been locked to just one frequency, generally speaking, the 5G backend allows the phones to transition between the different types of service um, to avail themselves of that ultra fast service when it is when the phone is close and in range of one of those ultra fast uh, radios and then transition off seamlessly to uh, one of the lower bands and slower services, but which, to your point, can penetrate buildings. And the Link 5G does support the deployment of all of those different types of radios. Um, we do expect it to be used more for the ultra wideband, um, but uh, it, it, it supports any, any radio technology, um, that, that comes in that small cell format, right? Like we're not going to put macro tower style radios antennas in them. They're, they're all small cell and designed to be, um, you know, designed in, in, in a structure like link 5g, but they will support the different frequency bands. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. 
I have two quick questions. I just wanted to clarify what was the procedure for, I guess, letting people know in the, the community that these 5G towers were going up. Um, Cause I did notice one just kind of some, one day just pop up around Hawthorne and Flatbush. And I also wanted to find out if there's still like um, opportunity for like comment period on their, like the way that they're physically designed. Cause for me, they look kind of imposing and stark they, they don't really like make me think of like pay phones at all. So I just wondered if there's still like a comment period for, for that. Sure. And I'll address your design question um, and I'll defer to, to Stacy to, to address the, um, the feedback question. Cause that's, that process is managed by uh, our partners at OTI on the design side. Um, this is already, uh, this design I would say is, is, is locked. Um, it's gone through the public design commission. We met with them many, many times over the course of about a year or so um, on this design. Uh, I agree with you, it's tall um, and it's big. Um, un unfortunately for this type of infrastructure, that's that's unavoidable. Um, we have uh, focused on making it as sleek and um, aesthetically, uh, uh, in my opinion, pleasing. I know that's a subjective um, uh, judgment, um, but you know, I think it, it's certainly, in my opinion, the best aesthetic design you can have for this type of infrastructure. Um, part of the reason the upper part of the pole is larger is because um, in the city of New York, you, we prioritize uh, uniformity and um, sort of cleanliness of, of, of um, presentation. So we are wrapping anything within those shrouds um, such that you can't see them. In other cities, what you'll see is different sized and shaped radios with wires kind of hanging off of them, just bolted to the side of a pole which I promise looks way worse um, and is, it sort of attracts the eye and sort of sticks out. Um, and our partners at Antenna worked, um, you know, with us and, and really educated me on like there, there's a sh I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a pretty stark break between the lower part of the pole and the upper part. And that's a, apparently a design feature that's used in large buildings as well, that those sort of sharp edges to um, encourage the eye to sort of it hits apparently the eye as it's traveling it sort of hits that and bounces off. And so it helps reduce the effect to pedestrians. We worked really hard with them to try to minimize that imposing effect that, that you're referencing. That's also why the shroud is it's a little sort of like off gray, really light bluish gray is to make it blend in with the sky behind it, whether there's clouds or not in the sky. So we, we did everything we could to try to minimize the imposition on pedestrians when these are installed. But I, I, I do acknowledge it is, it is a large piece of infrastructure. Um, and unfortunately, that's just the, the nature of uh, wireless telecommunications uh, poles like this. Stacey, do you want to um, tag? Yeah. Or, yeah. So um, you said Hawthorne and what was the? Um, Flatbush. The other cross, Flatbush. Okay. I was just looking it up on the map. I think that's in CB9, um, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, so most, most of the Link 5G sites that are up today did go through a 60-day common period. There is a small number of them that were approved during a time period where we um, were not doing the community review process on sites that were replacing payphones. That's how we deployed most of the original 1800 or so of the original links. Um, we did uh, last year make a decision to send out every single site to community boards. Um, and so in, in CB14 specifically, um, though there, there are none that were in that time period. Um, but we did send sites out sometime last year, I believe. Um, I think there were four sites, um, for community review. Um, we unfortunately didn't get any comments back, but, um, during this process, what we found is, um, a lot of people, uh, you know, further down the line have seen like, oh, where did this thing come from? We didn't know about it. Even if we did, you know, the community outreach to a T as far as what the, um, we have a memorandum of understanding with the borough presidents um, <clears throat> that we're supposed to send, that, send it out to um, community stakeholders. Um, we are uh, rebooting that process a little bit to make sure that everybody is is more aware of of it because they you know you see one one put up and then you wonder where to come from um so 
uh, right now, we don't have any um, proposed sites in your district. Um, and when there are going to be, um, they are sent to um, the community board, the council member, the borough president, and if it's applicable, it's sent to the bid as well. And then we rely on you guys, you know, you can, you can ask us to come to a meeting. You might just send me a few other stakeholders that, that might be interested. Um, so we're, we're working through making that process a little, um, a little easier for everybody so that everyone is as informed as um, they can be. Thank you. Uh, I see a hand up with Barden. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, did I read somewhere that there's been a discussion, you know, sort of sticking with the review concept that each individual tower should uh, receive its own individual environmental assessment? Um, that's not quite right. I think what you're referring to is uh, there's been some some media uh, hay uh, made out of um, a, a certain FCC process um, that sites do have to go through. Any any cellular radio deployment has to go through um, review uh, for both um, uh, historic preservation impact as well as uh, environmental review. Um, that environmental review is um, mainly, as I understand it, uh, to evaluate whether it is uh, in um, an area that is protected for some reason um, or in a wetlands or, or things like that. So a federally protected wetland. Um, I, I think my understanding of this, I'm not the expert, um, is that in New York City, generally speaking, the environmental side of that doesn't apply as a you know, highly built landscape. Um, the only one that, that tends to um, uh, ever come into play is the, uh, is, is the floodplain. Um, uh, aspect of that, um, which I'm, I'm not sure that we have any sites yet destined for floodplains in the city, um, but that is something on our radar. And you know, we leverage um, consultants to help manage that process to help ensure that the sites um, don't have any environmental impact um, that is, that's relevant to that, uh, to that FCC requirement. And the other is the historic preservation uh, review. And the sites do um, go through the state historic preservation office to ensure that they, um, that they either don't have a, uh, an impact or if they do that um, that is you, you know, known and maybe allowed. I, I might say, I mean, generally my understanding is that that would be, you know, the state officer will look at it and if it falls into um, local jurisdiction, they'll defer that to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, which is already a process that um, we've, you know, we've been talking to LPC now for over half a year about how this will work uh, when we get to that phase. So there's, there's a lot of different regulatory reviews and the, I think that's what you're you're, you're referring to, but um, happy to answer any other questions. Nope, that's fine. Thanks very much. Yep. Um, so, in the interest of time, I want to open up the, the floor for feedback from the general um, members of the the community um, and uh, just general public. I see a hand up from an um, Odette um, Wilkins. Odette, just a reminder to keep your uh, question or comment to two minutes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. I'm Odette Wilkins, and I'm President General, General Counsel of Wired Broadband, and I have a, a few questions to ask. First of all, I just want to say that there are 16 community boards now that have disapproved or declared moratoria or requested moratoria on the installation of these towers, and that includes Brooklyn CB9. There was a very long resolution that was just sent to the city and they disapproved not only the towers that are proposed, but that with respect to any towers that have already been installed, that they be deactivated. Now, with respect to the um, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act and National Historic Preservation Act review by the FC, uh, that the FCC has required City Bridge to conduct, um, where are you with that? Are you, um, have con has construction halted on all installation of Link 5G towers? And um, are you gonna be making that review available to the public? Uh, and also who are the consultants that you are using in that process? Um, yeah, I'll go really fast. Uh, we have one really important. And... I'm sorry, there was some 
talk after Odette that I couldn't hear. I didn't know if that was Dwayne, you, you chiming in or if Odette, were you done? Uh, apologies. Uh, something started on my uh, phone. Oh, I just okay. muted it. Okay. All right. We're happy to facilitate the, the answers to these questions following the meeting via email. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm not sure I caught every single one of those questions or that, that due to the uh, slight distraction at the end there, but I will say you know, we are, of course, going through um, the, the Section 106 review process uh, as required um, and, you know, had always, you know, planned to go through um, as part of just standard uh, cell uh, infrastructure deployment. Um, that's primarily managed by Zenfi, which is one of the partners of CityBridge. Um, and I can't off the top of my head, name the consultants, but there's a, you know, it's a very complicated and long review process. Um, and the, the consultants that are hired are experts in managing the, the voluminous amounts of paper that are required to, to, to manage that process. Well, is that going to be made available to the public? Is the review, um, the results of that review going to be made available to the public? Um, members of the public are registering as what are called consulting parties. Um, and my understanding is that they will be shared um, and given the opportunity to comment as part of that process. So, so yes. Okay, now that has to do with the Section 106 review. How about no, the NEPA review? Wait, are we, are we having back and forth at this meeting? That would be unusual. Respectfully, Odette, if you have a question you need that, that, that type of question, if you need it responded to, just send that to the board and, and we'll follow up. Okay, no, um, we have, we have questions. Questions. no, these are questions that I already asked before, but they haven't yeah, been you, you also ask these questions at very public meetings and at other boards as well. So you've already, you know, gotten a lot of these responses. So if it's a question that's relative to community board 14, I'd ask that you ask that question and seek a response there. Otherwise, I think a lot of these questions can be, can be sent to the board and there be follow up. All right, thank you. Any relevant questions for CB14 residents, or that may impact CB14 residents directly? Would it? I'm, I'm sorry, I already asked my questions. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Glenn, you'll have the um, the final question for the night. Uh, oh, actually, I see a quick hand. Okay, so Julie, you'll have the final question on this topic for the night, then we've got to move on in the interest of time. Glenn and then Julie. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, just quickly, since there seem to be people who are opposed to these, uh, would you know why they are? What is it about them that they find um, unappealing? That's, that's it, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I will try to not speculate too much, um, but from what I can gather from a lot of the opposition that I have heard and much of it very vocal, but from a small group of people, there is a group of people that has uh, the opinion that uh, 5G and wireless uh, radio frequency telecommunications in general are not safe um, and shouldn't be deployed uh, any further at all. And it probably would have it removed if they could, though I think that horses left the barn, so to speak. Um, so the one camp is that, um, uh, what you might call health concerns, um, and um, which I'll, I'll note, as far as I can tell, reviewing um, the the available literature is is you know there's no basis for that uh, point of view. Um, and then the other group is, as far as I know, purely based on aesthetics. They just don't want another thing on the sidewalk. They don't like that it's big, um, and for whatever reason, don't believe that uh, additional infrastructure is required. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Julie Martin. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, and to hear from City Bridge again. Um, I've been following this uh, from the community boards, just going to a lot of different meetings. And I, I'll speak as someone who's just been studying the, the health issues side of things. Um, there, uh, there is a large body of science, so like 10, uh, 10, up to ten thousand studies. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, you. Do you have a question for our presenter? Uh, okay, uh, uh, sure. Yes, um, thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, I'm curious about uh, the history with Verizon actually and the build out of of their fiber. Um, there was 
uh, a contract for them to actually replace the copper lines um, years ago. So I'm wondering why there was what, what was the process with City Bridge um, tapping into Verizon was are, is that considered proprietary to Verizon now because this is something that telecommunication um, uh, telephone customers paid with extra fees on their phone bills for years. So really it's it's a public asset and I guess it's a question for City Bridge and OTI um, why uh, that is not being tapped into the reason many of us think that. Um, we think that fiber optic access is the main thing that will cross the digital divide and then mobile needs will be after, you know, dealt with after in a more judicious fashion. But this seems to be putting the mobile needs first and then and, and we think it's an inferior. So it's not really going to help crossing the digital divide um, for most people. It's it's much superior to give them fiber first and then deal with the mobile needs after. Thank you. And so I, my question is. How are we going to be sure that these new fiber lines are going to be neutral and available to others? Because with Verizon, the same thing was told to us, but it's now it's not available and we're wondering what happened. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can, I can address that from the point of view of Verizon is a cable television franchisee for the city. Um, they, uh, to my knowledge, have been trying to um, decommission the, the copper wires for many, many years. Um, and our relationship with them as a franchisee relates to their build out of the fiber optic network for the provision of television services. Um, I don't, and I, I think Brett or or Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. I I don't think it has any bearing on the Link NYC franchise. Yeah, I, I would just very quickly add more broadly, fiber infrastructure is is obviously very important. We want people to get broadband service to their homes, and we encourage that through all of our telecommunications franchises. Um, but that is very distinct from mobile telecom service, which pole tops, Link 5G. Uh, our, the rooftop installations help support and help ensure that people who want to have mobile coverage and be able to traverse the city are able to be connected wherever they are, not just at home. But those are two very distinct efforts and, and both of which we feel very strongly about supporting and encouraging new deployments. Well, I, I'm just curious. It, it seems that Verizon is using its own lines that it built for its wireless I need, I need private services. Okay. I need I need to interject. Uh, we, we've got to move forward to meeting. Uh, so uh, your follow up, please uh, forward that to the board. And I encourage you all. Um, you know, um, Stacy and 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 Nick uh, have have offered to come out and do public presentations. If you do not already have their contact information, please reach out to the board, and we can get you connected to them so that they can come and present to your organizations or at a community meeting. Um, so there's opportunity for a more broad and more robust discussion. Um, tonight, we're here to present uh, the rollout for CB14. Uh, and a lot of these questions seem to be more broader scale uh, and require more in-depth conversation. So you can invite them out to your meetings uh, to have those discussions. All right. Uh, and just in fairness to the other presenters here tonight, we want to move forward with the agenda. Thank you very much, Dwayne. I appreciate your time. And thank you all for coming out and presenting. And I know Thank this you is guys. A very, very active topic, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, and um, so... uh, Sean, you have my email. You can share it with anybody. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out. Please. Thank so you. Thanks for that offer and for your time. We'll follow up. Okay. Um, if we're finished, I can move on to the next agenda item, which yes, is the presentation on expanding access to public restrooms with Julie Cho. And please, you know, correct me if I've mispronounced it from the Public Bathroom Task Force. Um, just a quick side point, Sarah uh, told me at the last meeting that she'd been digitizing all of the uh, records, I guess, from the Housing Committee from like 20 years ago or so and further back. And she came upon this very same discussion about the dearth of public restrooms throughout New York. And so it's something that has been on the plate of various groups for such a long time. And just for throwing a little levity, she said the group that had been studying it was called the Privy Council. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Julie. Please start away. I love that fact. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, yes, in our research, we 
I think it, the Dinkins administration is when public bathrooms became a big deal and there was a lawsuit um, against the MTA and uh, some temporary toilets were installed in our city. Um, so I'm going to share my presentation here. Um, so my name is Julie Chu. I'm an architect and in 2019, I helped publish a report on public bathrooms with the Urban Design Forum and I'm currently leading a public bathroom working group with uh, Manhattan's CB1, uh, CB4, 5, 6, 7, and then Queen's CB2. Um, I'm going to present some uh, research that we did and then talk about some legislation that the city has been working on since the pandemic and some of our proposals um, related to public bathrooms. Um, so in our research, we found that the city has 1,100 public bathrooms. Um, these are city-owned uh, bathrooms and some public-private partnerships. Um, so for a city of 8.5 million, that's one public bathroom for every 7,700 people, not to mention the uh, 50 million annual tours that we receive each year. Uh, we found only two public bathrooms are available 24-7, Penn Station and Port Authority. And um, we see this as a reason that there is a high public urination complaint. Um, we mapped out the 311 complaints over a period of 10 years, and you can see the high concentration in Manhattan. Um, for CB14, we um, show that there are 14 public bathrooms made up of subway stations, near public libraries, uh, parks and NYPD, and um, not all the MTA stations have reopened since the pandemic. Um, so uh, regarding our parks bathrooms, our city has 1700 parks and 662 bathrooms. So more than half of our parks are not, are not fully accessible to people who need access to bathrooms to use our public spaces. Um, our, we have 472 MTA stations. Uh, there's our 78 bathrooms in these stations. And again, they were all closed during the pandemic. A dozen have been reopened since. Um, the MTA is working to renovate these bathrooms and changing the maintenance around them. Um, I think they're proposing to close it, close it for an hour in the middle of the day and um, provide cleaning in the middle of the day. The bathrooms also include our transportation hubs and five of these automated public toilets. So these are the ones that have been installed uh, as prototypes in the city since in 1992. And over a period of 20, 30 years, we have five of them. Um, and I'll talk more about those later. The number also includes 216 library bathrooms. Um, 125 NYPD station bathrooms. And then the city has these privately owned public spaces, about 550 of them, mostly in Manhattan with some in Brooklyn and Queens. But we found only 14 of these spaces have access to public bathrooms. And one of the things our public bathroom working group is working on, um, we have three community boards approved uh, reso to support a zoning text amendment change to require bathroom access for um, pops of a certain size. So a little bit about each of these bathroom typologies. Um, one thing we want to know is that public bathroom is not a one size fits all solution just because the different needs of the populations that use these bathrooms, whether it's um, people who are unhoused, um, people who have um, issues like IBS or colitis to um, menstruating women, um, our seniors, um, families with children, everybody has uh, different needs. So it's good to um, look at these different types for um, the breadth of our city. Regarding comfort stations, um, in uh, 2019, our comptroller published a report called Discomfort Stations, where he listed all the um, broken um, parts and hazardous items um, across our uh, parks bathrooms. Um, there was 
quite a lot and we're not sure uh, the status of these issues. Um, unfortunately, our parks have um, only 0.5% of our city annual budget. And in our research, talking to someone who formerly works at parks, um, the city spends about $1,000 per acre per year, or the parks department does on uh, the um, parks, whereas um, public private partnerships like the Bryant Park Corporation uh, that run Bryant Park, they spend a million dollars uh, per acre over a year. So they are spending $300,000 on maintenance alone for the Bryant Park bathrooms. And that includes a full-time attendant, fresh flowers every day, all sorts of amenities for their bathrooms. And the Bryant Park bathroom is one of the nicest bathrooms in the city. Um, going back to our parks bathrooms, the other issue is that these new new construction bathrooms are costing the city $5 million a piece um, just because of the small scale of the project and the union labor. Um, it gets uh, pretty complicated and um, also time consuming to build. So one of the proposals um, parks has um, and in your recent testimony to city council is that they are looking to purchase five of these Portland loos to be installed in each of our boroughs. Um, so the Portland loo is a bathroom that Portland, the city of Portland funded and designed um, to um, dissuade unwanted activity. So these units are known for its lack of privacy. You can see the open uh, slats in the louvers um, so when you're inside, um, it's not only is it not private, um, the other item that I noticed is that it doesn't have a hand washing station inside the bathroom. Um, it just has access to the hand sanitizer and the hose bib is outside. So something to know, um, and as I mentioned, not one size fits all. Um, so jumping to the automated public toilets, these units are free. Um, they're part of the street furniture deal that Bloomberg signed in 2006, where Samusa, which JC Decote took over recently, would pay the city $1.4 million to provide 3,000 newsstands, 300, 3,000 bus stops, 300 newsstands, and 20 automated public toilets in exchange for advertising rights. So the bus stops and newsstands were installed right away. And after 17 years, 15 of the automated public toilets still are sitting in warehouse, a warehouse in Queens, which is really unfortunate because JC Deco would not only provide the unit, but install the unit and maintain the unit for free. Um, and there's a couple of reasons we, we found um, that we hoping the city could revise. Um, as it looks to renew its contract in the next three years when it expires in 2026. One of them being um, the approval process. It needs six levels of approval for each toilet. You need Department of Transportation, Department of Buildings, the Public Design Commission, the Local Community Board, um, City Council, and I think the Mayor. So this is something we hope can change along with kind of the, we hope can change along with kind of the uh, required clearances around these units, eight feet in front, five feet on the sides, and I think five feet below. Um, I wanna mention that Berlin and uh, Paris have over 400 of these units installed in each of their cities. Um, what's really nice about Berlin's toilets is that it's clad in this nice masonry um, panel which kind of fits with the city context because you can see it's a little bit jarring the stainless steel um, panels here next to the historical monuments at the Grand Army Terminal. And then for those that haven't used these APTs, they uh, you pay a quarter and you can use the unit for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, the door automatically reopens. And then afterwards, they have a spray arm that kind of cleans the, washes down the unit. And uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles have these 
scoreless right now. I think San Francisco had 25 um, installed in their city. What's nice is they have this pit stop program where JC Deco partners with a local nonprofit to provide full-time attendant, what they call ambassadors to each of these units to make them more friendly and um, accessible to the community. And then lastly, uh, one, la one other example is the um, Times Square subway station bathroom, which is also a public private partnership and has a full-time attendant. So Boston Properties back in 1990, early 1990s, when they were building their tower, and in order to get extra development rights, they uh, paid for the renovation of the Times Square subway station and provided um, these toilets. And in perpetuity, they're paying a local bid $100,000 a year to provide a full-time attendant that monitors these four stalls. Um, and something just to let local communities be aware of things that you can ask for. This is this is asked for by um, Midtown. So since the pandemic, our electives have been pretty um, busy with um, uh, public bathrooms, it's been on their radar. Uh, last year, City Council requested in their budget about $250 million for funding for comfort stations, uh, $50 million per borough. Unfortunately, we don't think this was funded, but um, it's a good uh, start. And then Manhattan Borough President and your local council member, Rita Joseph, uh, proposed uh, intro 258, which was actually approved uh, late last year, where DOT and DPR would um, look at a uh, proposed a bathroom site for each of our city's zip, uh, zip code. And this is something, this is a study that they gave one year uh, allowance to um, create and something we've been um, letting community boards know it would be great if local community boards um, recommend or identify locations themselves that they could pass along to DOT and DPR just because um, we think the local um, folks know best about where a uh, bathroom could be situated. Uh, they also proposed another intro but um, about maintenance uh, of um, parks bathrooms and getting that report every six months, but it would overlaps with a local law that um, was codified in 2022. But we know that Mahan Borough President and Rita Joseph have some other um, legislation that they will be um, proposing this year. So we're excited about those. And um, we did touch base with the Mahan Borough President and I think one will be coming out soon. Our public bathroom working group have been busy this past month looking at the open restaurants program as a potential to open existing public bathrooms um, for the city. So we see restaurants um, using our public realm and profit, profit, profiting from it as a way of um, maybe a, a equal exchange would be asking our restaurants to open up their private bathrooms to the public. So this is something we've been talking about with our elected. And one thing that came out of our conversation is potentially reducing the fee of uh, the open restaurant program for restaurants willing to open up their bathrooms to the public. So that would be a voluntary. And then perhaps for restaurants that are utilizing our public realm at a large a much larger capacity um, to be determined that those restaurants would op would be required to open up their bathrooms to the public. We have a lot of restaurants that are making a lot of money in Manhattan that a small uh, fee reduction is not gonna affect them at all. So, and since they're taking up so much of our public realm, we thought this might be a um, good exchange. And then, one of our community boards asked, you know, what about restaurants that don't participate in open restaurant program and if they could um, open up their bathrooms to the public. Um, so um, one proposal is that the fees generated from the open restaurant program 
would pay for stipends for restaurants not participating in the program to open up their bathrooms to the public. So just giving you a little background on the open restaurants program, and this is something that um, we presented to Manhattan CB5 last night, actually, and uh, it was approved by the committee to support a reso, and um, I'm actually working on a draft reso for them that hopefully they will pass um, at full board in um, June 8th. Um, so the open restaurant program, right now there's 13,000 restaurants participating with 3,200 in Brooklyn. Um, New York had recorded about 24,000 restaurant establishments in 2019. So more than half of our restaurants are participating in this program. Um, the chart below, you can see that more than half of the 3,200 uh, restaurants participating in Brooklyn are using both the roadway and sidewalk at the same time. Um, well, I hate to interrupt, but do you think maybe three, four minutes would be enough to, to run through the rest of your slides? Is that okay? Yes, yes, That'd definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry to interrupt. No problem. And then um, in CB14, there's about 100 restaurants participating. So even if a quarter of those restaurants participate, you would double the number of public bathrooms in your district. So imagine walking down these main thoroughfares where these restaurants are lined up and being able to use their bathrooms instead of looking for a library or a park uh, bathroom. And then these are the fees that were uh, published or released in the updated bill a couple of weeks ago. And the city, for 80% of the city, they really reduced the fee to $5 per square feet for roadway, $6 per square feet for sidewalk. So it's um, accessible to our restaurants across the city. And these are, these are numbers based on the area medium um, rent for commercial uh, premises. Um, and then it, it is um, potentially like, Potentially, they're looking at seasonal uh, for the roadway cafe, so it would be closed in the winter time. A quick diagram of these open restaurant um, clearance requirements. Um, so what you see here is about a little bit larger than one parking space. So we ran some numbers really quick to see how much this will cost. Um, the 150 square feet is more of a parking space, and then doubling that, you're looking at $750 to $1,500 for uh, uh, restaurants and block in CB14. Um, so Germany has a retail uh, bathroom program called the Nice Toilet, which they have been operation since 2000 in over 200 cities, and the city pays the retailer a stipend of $34 to $112 per month for opening up their bathrooms to the public. But that translates to about $1,400 um, annually for uh, more expensive cities. And then UK has the community toilet scheme, which is a similar retail bathroom program where the city pays them a stipend to open up their bathrooms to the public. And Paris is a little different where they have a menu of fees or stipends where accessible bathroom gets more money, uh, uh, retail that's open seven days a week gets more money, et cetera. This is um, their Great British Toilet Map showing a cafe that's opened and the features of the cafe, the hours of operation, something that we aspire to. Um, so this is something we wanted to run by your committee to see if you would be interested in supporting uh, this or advocating for this in your district. And um, I think that's it for the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. A lot of really valuable information, especially 15 million tourists coming through and we have such, you know, meager accommodations for them. It's one thing if you live in a neighborhood and you can either scurry back to your house or maybe you know someone in a local restaurant. But for somebody, you know, may not speak the language um, and is here very briefly, they must be absolutely baffled by uh, our disregard for their concerns like that. Before I open up for questions, I want to acknowledge Sabrina Dejust, who is here from Councilmember Farrah Lewis's office. And if you have any comment yourself or wish to 
contribute anything from the council member, please feel free to say it now. Or not, that works too. Then I will open it up to questions from board members. And I guess I see Corazon, you have your hand up. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to find out what's the timeline for reopening um, the bathrooms and MTA stations? Because there's one I know at Church Avenue, um, the BQ station. And I only ask about it because I know that there's a lot of like public urination and feces stuff like all around in that area and just wanted to know what what like what can I do or what could we do to help move it to open? Like, yeah, do you, like I don't have a contact. I mean, yeah, I don't have a contact at MTA that would be able to provide this information, but something definitely the district manager hopefully can reach out and uh, let them know. Okay, Glenn, you're up next, fire away. Thank you. More of a comment. Um, allowing restaurants to have space on sidewalks and take up parking spaces during the pandemic made a lot of sense. But now that we're pretty much past that, it seems to me that that space is a real boon to any restaurants that can utilize it and uh, requiring them uh, to open their bathrooms to the public simply for allowing them to use the the public uh, space uh, i don't think we need to give them a, a a financial incentive they're getting a financial incentive by taking public space and using it for their business and it's an uneven unequal thing if you happen to have a fire hydrant in front of your restaurant you can't do this if you happen to have a corner space you can put a long um set of tables on the side sometimes so uh, i i my personal opinion is they should simply be required to open their bathrooms if they're utilizing this space thank you very much julie anything you want to comment on that it, it certainly you know sean is always beating the drum of you know whenever public space is given up for private enterprise we always seem to get the short end of the stick and sure. You know, I, I saw what is it, thirty-four to one hundred and twelve dollars per month to a restaurant to be willing to open it up. Um, you know, I, do I also recall that it's DOT that is still administering the uh, the restaurants program, Dwayne? Stephen, are you here? I so. Steve, are you here? Cohen? Sorry, may have talked. I think that's right. That, that, that's my understanding. So actually, you know, this issue, it sort of crosses both us being economic development and you, you know, being DOT, but um, so I don't want to step on your toes, but the basically you were sort of asking us to sign on to the uh, the resolution you had posted. I think it might have been your last slide, was it? Actually, I have to draft it still, but I would just do a very, you know, draft version that your community board would adapt based on your needs. Um, it's, it's just something that I hope each community board would advocate to your local council member. And you have a really good council member that supports bathrooms. Okay, before I comment on that, uh, I'll let Joanne, our board chair, speak. Hi, thank you very much. And I'll echo uh, board member Glenn Wall in, in saying that um, using the public wet realm um, doesn't require a stipend for uh, the public to use the restroom. Um, I, I think that that would pretty much be the position, um, at least from my perspective, in terms of where we've been with open restaurants, where open, open restaurants are across the borough of Brooklyn um, and the opposition. Um, and if the public can seek a benefit from using the public realm, then we uh, will ask for a requirement from these restaurants to open their bathrooms to the public. Thanks. I mean, I always love going to these different boards to hear everybody's um, perspective on this. And, you know, it's glad I'm glad this is the first time I'm speaking in Brooklyn and glad to hear Brooklyn is, you know, pushing for that. Um, but one of the comments from our committee last uh, night was they want us to follow up with the Chamber of Con Commerce and the Hospitality Trade Association about our proposal, um, just how much, how this would affect 
uh, restaurants and the size of restaurants out there. Um, Liz, I believe you're next up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate hearing all of this data about the public restrooms in the area. Um, as someone who knows the area pretty well, because I live here and go around here a lot, I, I do often also struggle and, and usually end up having to buy something in certain locations to feel comfortable finding a restroom. Um, so, yeah, I definitely would support um, having, you know, something where we ask this of open restaurants that they make sure that their bathrooms are open to everyone and having a, a broader Thing that allows restaurants that aren't getting that benefit of using the roadway to um, also open up their um, bathrooms, you know, and make that clearer and more official. However, you know, we 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 in the city sees fit. Okay, um, Joanne, do you still have another question? Is your hand re-raised or original? No, no, re-raised. Um, just a quick comment. There is a there is a stipulation that restaurants that have less than 13 seats, um, this is as per the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, do not have to have a public restaurant a restroom. Um, I would like to say publicly that if um, a restaurant is using the public right of way and and um, that those seats that are accommodating diners be included in the count. So if interior seats and we understand now that the the program is seasonal interior seats are um less than 13 seats they don't need to have a public restroom but if seasonally they have uh greater than 13 seats including outdoor public right of way then that should be included in the count and therefore they should include a public restroom in this program do you see where i'm going so we need to be very clear that um, a restaurant's not going to get a pass because they have less than 13 seats and don't have to provide a bathroom, even though the rest of the seating is outdoors. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to mention Manhattan CB1 have been looking at the occupant load and pushing for the occupant load on the outside of the uh, restaurant to be included in the count for, with the inside to calculate the number of fixtures required for the restaurant. I don't know, Betty uh, said she was going to join, but she was writing the reso on that. So. If you guys are interested in um, having me draft, provide a draft result, I can include language from that community board that, that's been thinking of, about the same thing. I mean, you can present it and we'll consider it. You know, it won't be until we return in September, that's for sure. We're not gonna consider it for the June meeting. Um, so that would be later in September uh, when we meet again. But um, we have to differentiate also, you know, occupancy is an FDNY thing and then occupancy is a is a Department of Health thing. So there are two different occupancies. So Department of Health says 13 seats or less, you don't need a public restroom, but FDNY occupancy is different. Um, so I'm not sure which direction you're going in. Um, based on your schedule, I do wanna mention that we think uh, City Council will pass open restaurants, the bill very, very soon. Um, this is why we've been pushing our RN to get our own boards to pass this, but we do know that the open restaurant program will be in flux. They're trying different things and um, whether it's gonna be open seasonal or not. So even if we don't get it in before it's approved, we think community board reso even in the future would help push and mold this legislation as it evolves. I mean, um, I, you know, in conjunction with the co-chairs of, of this committee, we can consider writing a letter to our council member with our thoughts on this program, but we're not going to pass a rezo uh, or even consider a rezo until September. Our June meeting is far too busy. Sounds good. Wayne, you're up. Go ahead. Um, actually, I'm, I'm curious if, just asking if uh, uh, Julie can pull up that last slide with what her uh, ask for resolutions were. Um, I know you're going to share with the board, but I just want to quickly see what that was. So there's three things. The first one is voluntary, but you guys can remove that and just require all restaurants participating to um, have open their, up their bathrooms to the public. And then we don't know where the, the fees are going to be used for the open restaurant program, and we want it to be earmarked for a stipend 
for restaurants not participating in the program but want to open up their bathrooms to the public? Um, okay, I mean, uh, we'd appreciate it. Like Joanne said, uh, it just, it's just too late to, to have this added to our June agenda, but it's something to be considered in possibly the September meeting. So if you could share this with the board uh, following this meeting, um, then it's something we can bring to the attention of our uh, committee again in September and possibly have some discussion and maybe um, introduce a resolution for our board to vote on. So um, that would be very appreciated. Thanks. I also um, have a draft. Sorry, really quick. I have a draft letter uh, to our electeds. So if you want to send a letter, I can also afford you that. If we well, we we would great. need to have discussion with the rest of the, with the committee and the other board members. Uh, we, we don't have an opportunity to do that right now, but you can send it along. We will definitely bring it up in our September meeting. Please do. Um, Sarah, is that you? Had your hand up earlier and then lowered it. Um, I was going to pass just for time's sake because I know there's one other presenter. So move on. Okay. Um, if you want to put something in the chat, feel free. Just go ahead. Um, I believe Steve, you were up next. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I don't think I'd feel comfortable, um, like, uh, voting on any resolution before at least getting input from the local bids. Um, I'm not sure if. Um, the junction bid really has, and I guess, I guess there, there, are, there might be a few that have open restaurants and, and the junction bid, but, um, in terms of the, the, the church Avenue and the Flatbush bid that, uh, I, I'd like to hear what. Business owners would have to say about opening their restrooms to the public, and um, you know, just 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 make sure we're we're getting the the business, the the restaurant end perspective. Um, I, I mean, I you know, I I think that I think that would be a, a good place to to go before we vote. And um, you know, I, I'm thinking one of the things that came to mind was this notion of if the outdoor space. Uh, Put the res restaurant over the twelve person cutoff or what have you. I could envision a situation where a restaurant has like a very inaccessible, you know, restroom location only for employees, and opening that up that up to the public might be, you know, logistic a logistical nightmare from the business perspective. But you know, that, that's that's partially speculation on my part. But my main point is, I, I do want to get some restaurant input before we would would vote on anything. Thanks, Steve. Understood. Uh, Glenn, let's finish up with you on this issue. Thank, thank you very much. I, I'm just curious. Um, the program that's being proposed means that some restaurants will and some restaurants won't participate. How is the general public supposed to know which bathrooms are open and available to them? Uh, which is also one of the reasons why I think that all restaurants, including ones with some difficulty, if they're going to use public space, should open their bathrooms and therefore the public will know if they see seating outside, they can go inside. But short of that, how are we supposed to know which bathrooms are available? That's my question. Thank you. Yeah. That's why I showed some of those images with stickers on the storefront. And then I showed you some of the maps, the great British toilet map would take the DOT map that they have all, all the open restaurants and just add another layer where the restaurants with the open bathrooms would be identified and hopefully some function of the hours of operation and stuff. I'm sure Yelp would help. Yes. So then Google. I'd like to close, go ahead. All right, um, then I'd like to just close this out so we can move on to our last agenda item. Thank you again, Julie, great presentation, really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again and signing on to you know, your proposals, et cetera. Great, thank you so much. So our last agenda item is the update on the Shirley Chisholm Monument at Prospect Park uh, South Entrance. And I believe we have reps from uh, the Percent for Art program, and I believe the artists who uh, are responsible for creating the monument. So which among you would care to start? I'm assuming you're all still here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is David Mandel. Good evening, everyone. I'm from the Department of Cultural Affairs from the Public Art Unit. Uh, thank you, uh, especially to Sean and Patricia for helping to coordinate this meeting for all of you uh, for welcoming us here tonight. We're excited to share an update on the 
Shirley Chisholm Monument uh, by artist Amanda Williams and Olalakin Javis. Uh, tonight uh, presenting will be uh, Kendall Henry, the Assistant Commissioner from the Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as artist Amanda Williams, who's with us. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to them in a second. I just wanted to um, let you know that what you're going to see tonight is what we call the conceptual design. So um, nothing has been built or fabricated yet. This is kind of a step along the way uh, for our for our engagement and approvals to uh, having this uh, you know brought to you. Uh, we hope to go to the public design commission for a public meeting in June. And uh, between now and then, we're we're doing a number of presentations, and this is one of them. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kendall. I have some slides to share. Kendall will uh, tell you a little bit about the context of the project, and then uh, we'll get to the to the best part where Amanda can uh, tell you about the art itself. So I'll share. Great, my thanks screen. so much. Thanks, David, and and thank you all for having us. Uh, I just want to give you some context. Some of you may have remembered a couple of years ago um, the previous administration introduce the She Built NYC initiative. Uh, this is to begin to correct the lack of representation in our monuments of women in New York City. And we started with our very first monument, which is the one to Shirley Chisholm, and was and selected Amanda Analalakin as part of that. Um, and um, so we're here to just show you, Amanda's here to show you where we are at the process. Again, like David mentioned, uh, this is the beginning of um, the design review process. We are going to go to the PDC next month and um, present to the other community boards um, as part of this. So with no, no further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Amanda. Hey, thank you all for having me tonight. Um, and also um, thank you for being so patient. We too are excited to uh, move forward with this. Uh, I was interrupted with COVID. We were selected back in 2019. so. Um, we remain excited and committed and uh, welcome your feedback. So my name is Amanda Williams. I'm one half of the design team, the arts artists that were selected. Uh, Lake JFS is my uh, counterpart and is unfortunately not able to be here tonight. He's a 20 plus year resident of Brooklyn. I'm a Chicago and don't hold it against me. I love Brooklyn. Um, and so we wanna walk you through a little bit of our initial proposal that we presented um, that resulted in our selection and then our responses to feedback we've received from several entities, including um, parks uh, to modify and hopefully improve um, the process. So Lake and I are architects, as is Julie. So we studied at Cornell University together and um, we've done a number of public works, um, but nothing as ambitious as this. We, we took the brief to heart, which asked us to reimagine how um, women might be represented in the 21st century um, after having not been really represented at all. And so we really um, took it as an opportunity to think about the way Shirley Chisholm um, brought people together and really wanted to um, expand access for the everyday resident to be part of um, the civic process. And so we thought that it was important that this create a place as much as it represent a kind of traditional um, visage of Shirley herself. Um, so we really worked to create something that was a hybrid of something that would be recognizable as her figure, but then also something that could expand itself to really be a place that people felt like they could come together or pass through or see as a kind of um, beacon. Next slide. So in our initial design, um, we imagine something that would uh, be both a gathering place as well as a pass through. It's at the Parkside entrance to Prospect Park. So we uh, did a hybrid of kind of three things that we thought were important to that component. So one again is her image that is um, so iconic. The second is the importance of uh, the Capitol building both in her uh, trajectory as the first black woman elected to the US Congress. Um, but also what that building has represented to so many of us in ideas about democracy. And then lastly, um, the, the location at a beautiful park. And so ideas about filigree, uh, flora, and then also ideas about the history of um, gates or thresholds that would lead you into or out of the park. Um, next slide. Um, so our feedback from that was, um, a more clearly defined kind of monumental experience, um, really thinking about the scale 
um, thinking about elements that might create um, ADA hazards, um, conflicts with flow of movement through the original orientation did not necessarily um, provide that kind of ease of, ease of, of flow. And then also things that might encourage climbing um, or harming little fingers and hands and so forth to think about those elements. Um, and then things that would, would really kind of contribute to um, an ease of maintenance as much as a public uh, work could be uh, maintainable. And then also a way to, um, to compromise between needing to light the structure so that it could serve as a beacon, but not contributing to um, sort of noise pollution um, in, the, in the vicinity. Uh, next slide. So we've worked to think about those elements and then also to think about um, ways that we could advance um, other excited ideas people had about ways to improve the structure. So we've simplified uh, the design sculpture in many ways that I'll show you in a second through the images. Um, we reduced the overall scale height from 40 feet to 32, and I'll show you that in the context of the trees and other capital improvements that are um, being created. We've removed the fencing altogether, which was um, in that initial design kind of covering this, this um, scooping of the ground to create that, that congressional um, arc. Um, and so we flattened that so that the, the arc is represented, but in a, in a transition of a paving um, color or finish on the ground. And then we've adjusted um, the scale of elements that you can reach um, in the pass-throughs to be higher so that it's um, difficult to um, even jump to reach those heights. Um, and then we've thought very carefully about a variety of um, ways that uh, differently able people might need to move through the space so that there's there's ways to um, not only comply but to signal um, that this is a welcoming place for all and we're in the current process of working to understand the way to achieve kind of the aesthetic that we want but also use materials that are going to um, not require a lot of maintenance or frequent maintenance um, should the work be vandalized or um, heavily touched, which is going to happen definitely at those lower levels. Next slide. So as I mentioned, that element that is the silhouette that um, faces the gate as you pass in and out, we thought about um, ideas of English gates and filigree and the use of flora and fauna historically as elements um, that are that you see on screens or you, that you might see in thresholds. And so while we wanted this obviously to be a nod to um, her important role in the US government. We also know that that Brooklyn is home to a wide variety of um, uh, Caribbean immigrants as well as others and that she herself was from Barbados. So we thought about the flora and fauna that um, might be a beautiful mix of those and offer a little bit um, more for those that were interested in studying um, the, her history um, at an even deeper level. Next slide. And so that primary, that primary kind of sculptural move that we made took that initial image um, that was used when she announced her presidency back in 1972 as our first image, and then images of her related to the Capitol that we then um, simplified um, and and um, collaged together to become one of the one of the um, the silhouettes. Next slide. Then there's that the fauna flora kind of element. So these look disjointed, a little bit confusing at this in this break, broken down realm. But we thought it was important that you understand that we've considered it from all of the angles because this is an intersection of actually um, th three routes that we've thought about the way you might move through it depending on what your typical route is, and that it can provide something um, interesting from from various um, elements. And that you'll see, I'll show you the heights later, but this is where we raised the heights. They initially were thinking about the ability of somebody to comfortably walk through. Now we've raised that to make sure that even um, taller folks jumping um, would have a harder time grabbing and that there are no side elements that allow people to kind of hook um, feet or arms into trying to reach up. Next slide. And then there's this flattened ground surface that in that initial, initial winning um, competition entry was kind of sculpted or we imagine this kind of scooped out ground. We've now flattened that and are considering um, what kinds of pavers could be 
um, used to signal the differences. And then also a special um, inset of bronze, or if it's not bronze, a different finish that could occur in order to signal her specific seat. This is for rendering purposes, so this might not be her actual seat. We still have to work through some of those elements and details, but this was a direct response to um, concerns about leaves gathering, water, you know, pooling, it's, it, anything that's going to change the ground plane. And then on the far right, I'll point out that um, we have a quote that she said during that initial speech to run for president um, that we would like to be carved um, in stone on this groundwork. And I should also mention more abstractly, and most of you probably already know this, this is part of a larger um, improvement that's happening in the entire area. So we're trying to work closely with landscape um, from from the Parks Department also to make sure that um, we're in lockstep with where this will be situated in relationship to their larger um, works with ground ground surfaces, whether that be the sidewalks that are approaching or in that plaza in particular. Next slide. And so here you see it from above. So um, I'm sure most of you know this, but for we've been saying for frame of reference, directly on this access would be the McDonald's to our upper right, and then the train entrance to the left. And then you'll see the heights of the trees that are gonna be um, in, the, in this immediate vicinity, and then the reduced height of the sculpture so that it is um, substantially less than those primary trees um, for that entry into the park, and then about the height, a little bit less than, than the, um, the tree to the, to the Ocean Avenue side, and then a little bit taller than the one to the park side. side. Next slide. And there you see it in elevation, just to give you a sense. We felt it was important that she was so outsized that it does um, make its presence known, especially from a distance. But as you move closer, the height of it um, kind of disappears or dissipates as you focus more on the scale of the capital and your movement through it. Next slide. And then these are just some renderings to give you an idea of um, how we're trying to still represent that congressional arc, but also um, be sensitive to an idea about um, tripping hazards, maintenance, um, pooling of leaves, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Uh, it'll make beautiful shadows at different times of the day. Um, you can see from the materiality, I should probably talk about that. We do really want um, to have this this variation between some of the elements, those early slides we'd imagined um, being able to achieve some of that color um, through integrating paint into metal. We're still working through that. That's not a long-term solution for maintenance. Um, so we're thinking about um, metals, various metals themselves that might have the patination or the ability to be patinated in a way that would achieve that. So you're seeing a kind of silhouette in a, in a polished, um, bronze and then a meshing of different materials. So we're we're trying to um, kind of mix and match to understand the ways that we can still achieve that contrast, but at the same time, again, do something that's that's um, that's more feasible in terms of maintenance. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So while this is a beautiful image, this will take a lot of work to figure out how to um, properly provide light while also being um, respectful of our neighbors and then also constraints that are presented by um, who controls access and rights to to which poles that might be um, able to help light the structure um, and hopefully avoid adding or trying to propose additional polling or additional um, urban infrastructure to provide lighting. So um, that's still something that we're very um, committed to, but also want to be sensitive to um, what those constraints might be and how to still achieve um, a positive um, kind of uh, experience even at night with this with the structure. And I think that's the last slide. Okay, so we're, we're happy to uh, receive feedback and questions. We really do take it quite seriously. Um, 
So we're excited about this process. It's been a long time coming. We have, I think, a meeting with, with CB9 at some point as well, but I'm really wanting to get feedback from, from you know, those of you that will enjoy this the most. Thank you so much, Ms. Wentz. I, uh, I really never quite appreciated the, uh, the far reaching concerns that you have these days in putting together outdoor sculpture or edifices like that. I mean, the materials, the lighting, people climbing, jumping, tripping, leaves, water. So, you know, in the old days, I'm professionally, I'm in the art world. So, I mean, it was, you'd put up a sculpture and it was just there and all you worried about were pigeons. So <laughs> for, you, for you now to have gone through all this, I, I really appreciate it. So you did mention timing. So what do you anticipate the timeline will be before you know, you actually have something to come back to us and CB9 to show that, you know, I guess the Public Design Commission will have approved, et cetera. Yeah, a lot of it is just the, the approvals process and making sure that we've been thorough um, with making sure everyone has had a chance to, to offer insight. And then, um, relatively speaking, I think it's a in our minds a, a relatively short window, several months, probably over the summer, to really um, be able to hone in on exactly what materials are going to get us both the, the, the kind of aesthetic that we want, but then also obviously try to stay on budget, um, meet concerns about maintenance. So those three things are kind of driving our ability to provide um, extremely specific, you know, kind of understanding of is this stainless steel, is this patinated bronze, is this aluminum, is, you know, we, obviously we know it's a, a metal of some description. And we know a little bit about the fabrication strategies based on quotes we've been receiving from fabricators. Um, but that specificity of that materiality is definitely top of mind. Obviously also coordinating with this ambitious larger, you know, kind of revamp of this entire area to make sure that it does not feel like a thing kind of plopped down. And so we've, we've enjoyed that we've been able to have these conversations. You know, I was, I was literally there on March, 14th, 2020. So, you know, we were having these conversations right up until that moment that we had to pause. So we're, we're trying to make sure that it really does feel from the pavers to the elements, um, you know, as close to what we're imagining, but also not something that has to then get, you know, kind of, you know, uh, maintained very soon after we make it. Um, so, so I don't know, th there's a lot of moving parts. There are all of the committees, but then there's also um, coordination to make sure that a lot of the work that's still underway in terms of this larger area is coordinated. So for example, the, the, the color of the paper or the type of paper, right? So we have general ideas, but to nail down, we really have to, to kind of get approval and coordination across several of these entities. So I can lean on my colleagues to help me understand better as, as a non-New Yorker, it's harder for me to understand what's happening, but we do have our, our PDC in June. I think we have, we're trying to get the, the CB9 before or in the midst of that so that we'd be through all of the kind of meetings and presentations early on in the summer. We go back and do our homework on the specifics and then hopefully in the fall, there's a there's a better clarity and we can return when you all are back in session with some specifics about um, specific material choices. That's so, awesome. so amongst the three of you who are here, um, any one of you care to just hazard a guess on the day of an unveiling? Because uh, I know that the public's going to ask, you know, they're <laughs> going to want to know when is it going to go up? So barring another pandemic. Uh, what, just could one of you throw out a best guess as to, you know, when you're clearing away space for uh, the grand celebration? We'll be able to provide a best guess after we go to PDC in June, uh, because again, a lot of different um, comments and, and suggestions will, you know, determine that quite a bit. So, so after June, you could ask that question again, and we may be able to get, get a better <laughs> guess. If, if you do have a press release or something where you're going to announce it, or if you've made any decisions and have any renderings, et cetera, please forward it to the board office and we'll see about inviting you back or whatever. But as soon as there are new data and information and scheduling, please let us know. Of course. Then on that, I will throw it open to questions from uh, the public, I believe. Oh, Dwayne, actually my co-chair has a question. Go ahead. I just wanted to throw, this is David again. I just wanted oh, to. Okay. Um, 
I just wanted to add into what Kendall was saying, you know, and what Amanda was mentioning. So um, we're presenting to you tonight where we have upcoming presentations to CB9 and the, also the Prospect Park Alliances uh, Community Committee. Um, and this is all in advance of the Public Design Commission. Uh, we, we've been briefing electeds as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is part of getting the word out. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, this is the conceptual design. So um, there's more to be done once we get past that approval uh, for, you know, the materiality and the, the engineering and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, hope, hopefully hope to get back to you, you know, with a with a stronger, with a more firm update when, you know, as those details come together. As one, as an outcome of this presentation tonight, we are, we, we do request a letter of support, you know, should, should the committee feel uh, inclined, uh, we'd love to have a letter of support to, to provide to PDC that, that we were here and your, your thoughts on the, uh, on the conceptual design. So uh, with that, you know, please uh, feel free. You can ask questions of, uh, Okay, actually, I had not scrolled all the way down, Dwayne. Should I maybe ask? I can, you oh, would you like me to leave this image on, or um, I can also? Yeah, you can take it off. That way, I can follow yeah. my screen Sorry. a little bit more yeah. clearly. So, Joanne, why don't you go ahead? Oh, well, I mean, Dwayne and Elizabeth were before me, so please let them two go before me, and then I'll ask my questions. Okay, I couldn't see how the hands went up. So, Dwayne, go ahead. Uh, thank you all for uh, this wonderful presentation tonight. Uh, as a Proud Barbadian myself, or Bajan, as they say, myself. Um, I'm happy to see. Um, I'm, I'm waiting for this monument to go up. Also, you know, as a member of the the newly or re, you know minted in the last six or seven years, Little Caribbean community that's heritage community that's been established in the area. Uh, this is something we're all looking forward to. Um, that said, I'm also a resident right around the corner uh, from the the site, and I actually am a co-founder of the. Uh, Parkside Plaza across the street in front of the train station. So um, I'm curious about the design that I saw. Mm -hmm. uh, I see some of it involves um, re-imaging the overall entrance of the park and in that moving some moving the bike lanes to what it looks to be the backside of the entrance. Um, just questions around that and and have you what you guys are considering as far as safety concerns. The other is on the front end, I would like you to consider in your design maybe adding some sort of barricade that kind of funnels people to the crosswalks because one of the biggest challenges we have there now uh, around safety is people kind of crossing wherever they feel like crossing um so and that creates problems not only with the cars but with cyclists uh and pedestrians and we want to minimize the amount of of interaction between those three groups to, to reduce the number of 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 accidents so uh, I'd love to know what your thoughts are about that and uh, around the shifting of the bike lanes to the back end and what safety um, um, parameters you're planning on implementing. And then the suggestion of, in, of course, incorporating some sort of barricade in the front, a fencing of some sort. I, 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 really, I really appreciate this because um, obviously, as somebody, we spend a lot of time like kind of trying to be still and understanding the flow, but because it's not laid out like this currently, that really helps to kind of open our eyes about an idea about moving the bike lanes to the back and what, what happens when that speed is happening if people are moving that way. Um, we are not responsible for that overall layout, but I will communicate that information to Parks um, and their team that's that's proposed that. And I think also you're, I, you're thinking about barricades. So, we had we had something right around the immediate sculpture, but I think what you're saying about, although it doesn't seem like it's that big, it does allow people to kind of, you know, they cut through and they wait and they run. And, you know, so an introduction of an idea about, is there, are there rails or barricades that are not immediately at the sculpture, but are further back to help guide people or to discourage kind of- Along the front, yeah, along, yeah. Sorry no, I know what you're talking about. Front edges, so yeah. we, will, we will definitely share that. And I, I agree with that kind of um, thinking about how do you, how do we gently encourage the behavior that is gonna not lead to somebody crashing in whatever mode of movement um, with one another. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, Joanne has deferred to Liz, go right ahead, Liz. Hi, um, yes, um, I also wanted to just note something about the, the bike movement here. Um, as someone who rides often and often enters at that park, like I'm really excited about 
this beautiful monument. I think it's super important to the community and the thought you've put into it is just immense. Um, I would love to see, you know, I, I personally think it's okay to have the bike lanes in the back, but I will note that without having a better connection safely from the street, which sounds like something would require coordination with DOT, like it'd be easy right now from the Parkside bike lane to get in there. But if you're coming from the east or the south or from Ocean Avenue, where there isn't a bike lane, but there was a plan for it for forever, it's really hard. And, um, you know, I probably, if I was coming from the east or south, will dismount my bike, walk it across and go there. But I also know from experience that if I'm doing something like that, there are gonna be people just riding through. Um, so, you know, I think it'd be really good to, uh, if there's a way to coordinate with DOT, um, especially because Parkside and Ocean is actually one of the most dangerous intersections in the city. Um, it's been identified as a vision zero priority intersection, which means it's had a high number of crashes or injury, serious injuries to pedestrians um, and cyclists. So, um, you know, I, I'm really, I, I enjoy I like this a lot. I think it, it's actually nice to calm that traffic at that area, but I just want to make sure that there's an, uh, you know, and, and make bikes maybe go a little slower to get in because people going, you know, whether you're commuting or going to the park, like it's okay to have a little bit of a, a detour, if you will. But I just want to make sure that getting to that detour from the intersection is really, really safe for everyone um, so that people are encouraged to go the least conflict ways, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes. And just one one quick point of clarity. So also is the is the concern that there are blind spots, like the people that would just move through that that somebody coming in and out of the entrance would hit, or is it more that there's not an easy flow from wherever you might be coming on your bike onto that plaza area and then onto your destination? I would say it's a little bit the easy flow, but I don't, like personally, as someone who walks and bikes, that's like the main ways I get around and take transit. I would rather like when I'm walking to not be walking right by bikes. And I'd rather when I'm biking to not be biking right by people walking because it's a little, sa it's safer when everyone has their own spot. Um, so I like the idea that there's only walking there, but just, mm -hmm. it'd be good Go to ahead. improve the connections to that, you know, those new exits that are those new bike entrances and exits on the back. Like, I know that's not something in the scope of maybe not in the scope of this, but a coordination with DOT to make sure that there's a safe spot for bicyclists to, yeah. to get on by the intersection. <laughs> that's where I was going to head with this, which is yet again, we're Steve stepping on Steve's toes. And my instinct is that whenever you might come back to us with the final proposal, maybe it would end up being like a, a joint committee meeting between DOT or separate ones you know, with us as cultural affairs and them as DOT. So at that, Joanne, finally, you've been so patient, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just reiterate what I put in the chat and I sort of echo what has been talked about with the bike lanes, but also I noticed that the, <clears throat> the monument has now created a cohesive square. If you look at Parkside now, there is actually a road that goes in and that road services Lakeside. So I'm really curious which Lakeside is operated by a concessions operator and they have a vested interest to have that road open. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of interested in how that's going to work. Um, again, you know, I don't know what's safer but to have a truck enter, which is basically through your monument and go up to Lakeside <laughs> or have a truck enter through uh, Makachi Square, which is over on Coney Island Avenue and have them drive through the park and then have them go into Lakeside. So there's a little bit of coordination there and the concession operator. I have no comment there. I just want to point that out. And I, I appreciate, well, first of all, I forgot to say, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. Brava. Yeah. I love everything that you're doing. And then the other thing I wanted to just add was with regards to lighting, can you integrate LED lighting into the shape of the yes. monument? Yes. And then perhaps some details, details that are, that will let everyone know at night that this is um, mm -hmm. Shirley Chisholm because um, those are low voltage. Uh, they can be protected by the metal uh, embedded in the shapes. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. If it's something that you're, you know, if you, I, I agree that it needs to be lit at night um, and, 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 and be spectacular at night without sort of intruding on the neighbors because it's such an open place, but that might be one way, and then you have a lot of control over the amount of output that you're putting for that um, for that light that's lighting the sculpture. So I just wanted to add that, and again, amazing, beautiful, so excited to see this happen. Thank you. Thank you. We had not thought of that, but we will look into into options um, that could help provide that because I think it 
reinforces the kind of that outline always that we have there anyway. Uh, Corazon, I believe you might be next. Uh, thank you. Awesome presentation. And I'm also really excited to see Shirley Chisholm go up. I mean, just as a kid, just seeing her like, oh. so, <laughs> so, but uh, now to my like questions, um, I wanted to find out if, are you guys like restricted in the metals that you can use? I think I heard you mention aluminum uh, for a moment, but I didn't know, I wanted to find out if, how that would be affected by the elements that it's exposed to. And the shrubbery and plants that you are going to like integrate what are their like, um, I guess, growing patterns or seasonal patterns? Is parks really committed to the upkeep of them if they're like perennials and stuff like that? And I wanted to find out if there's going to be, I, may, I might have missed it, but is there like an educational component that tr like really says that this is um, Shirley Chisholm, that the that, that kids that can come up, it's accessible, or some kind of a language thing that, that people can know that who this person is, what they did, why, what is their significance and what they continue to provide, you know, to people now into the future. Excellent questions. I'm going to go backwards. Um, so we had thought of that early on when this was part of, we are the first of five. And so we assumed always that there would be something that would be an educational component that would go with it, but it's been on pause for so long that we sort of have forgotten about that. So it's important to bring that back, whether that's, um, something that you could access through some other device or a tandem of something that's permanent that's there that's also visually accessible um, to all you know all types of folks cited or not and then um, how does that connect with all kinds of entities that are already doing that work so that's also important those folks were at the very first um, presentation we made when we were finalists um, groups that are invested in the history of Shirley Chisholm so definitely kind of need to bring that back uh, that seemed like an obvious component early on and now this has taken so long that we sort of forgot so we will definitely think back to that and have conversations with our colleagues of department of cultural affairs because that'll affect all five potentially like we could do a coordinated effort about what that looks like and how you can access it even if you're not on the site um the second question remind me again the second one was about um, um the shrubbery. Shrubbery. shrubbery so the or images shrubbery. i showed you are actually the um just the kind of die cut filigree that would infill um oh. some of those angles mm -hmm. what you see as the rendering is what we've received from parks so we haven't we haven't weighed in on any of the landscape softscape that's in the vicinity we mm -hmm. could pass on to them that that could be interesting to think about what the interplay is between these these elements that are really just silhouettes to give you a little hint of gotcha. your background and what that might look like in terms of their selections, because it's still an active process. Um, and then the first question about restrictions of materials, we're not technically restricted in any way. We've been open to think about how to design it, but we're trying to be conscious of this, of this kind of balance between um, when you paint something, then you can scratch the paint off or when you, you know, like, but then the cost of, Although beautiful, bronze at this scale in this economy with, with raw materials, you know, quadrupling since we started this project. So we, we are examining it from every angle to kind of make sure that we're picking materials that will do what we want them to do, but also not making this cost prohibitive so that it's, it either has to be so diminutive that it's not giving the same energy or, you know, so delicate that you have to be maintaining it all the time, especially since we're, you know, I don't want to be cursed out by the, the people that have to <laughs> that have to keep it beautiful. So we really try to be sensitive to both of those. So that's what's driving the choices. So we're really exhausting all the kind of um, metals that might um, make sense. Um, then also, obviously, at this scale, how do these pieces come together? Where are normal natural break lines? Could we be mixing and matching metals? Does that create reactions? You know, so really trying to think through all those things so you don't have those weird drip lines, you know, or or if it's naturally going to patina, what's a beautiful way that can happen so that it, it really evolves as opposed to like, I remember when it was so beautiful, you know, like you don't want that. So. Um, Thank you. I mean, that answer was really detailed, so I really appreciate that. You will. And um, Amanda, there have been two great suggestions in the chat. Right. I don't know if you've seen them as for connections mm -hmm. with the Brooklyn Public Library and Little Caribbean. Uh, as possible partners for the education component. So definitely, we actually presented in the library. So this is is full circle. That was a perfect, cracking and exciting moment. So 
we love all of that to stay as part of its story. Great. Um, Dwayne, and then I see there's one last question from someone named Teresa, and then we should probably wrap this up. Uh, I'll defer to Teresa. She's had her hand up for a little while. Teresa, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I'm actually from CB9 and came about the 5G towers and ended up listening to this um, because Odette called me. Uh, I was just wondering when you think you're going to present to CB9 and if you needed someone to, I'd be willing to go over there and, and live stream or make a video for you so you could see how the area has changed with those new uh, bike lanes on Parkside and where the potential yeah. ones might be on Ocean, to, just to give you a preview and an idea of what's happening there in, in real time, if, if you need that. I know people uh, on CB9 and in Crown Heights and PLG are very excited for this, and I'm really happy to come across your presentation by accident tonight. So uh, if if you need any kind of facilitation for the CB9 meeting, I'll, I'll be willing to, you know, contact the board or whatever you need. Uh, oh, thank you so much. David, I'm yeah. going to pass it over to you because you know our uh, you've yeah, been coordinating I, all of our schedules. <laughs> we've been uh, we've been coordinating some potential dates with CB9 and, and um, we're trying to get something in before, you know, the summer break. Um, I think we had a potential date on June 20th at a committee meeting. But um, you know, we want to make sure as many people as possible, you know, get get to uh, get to see. Yeah, we want to work out because I had I had no idea we were just waiting. So I'm happy to, you know, I I know I think you probably do on uh, the parks uh, parks committee, right? Yeah, uh, we're afraid I have to leave. The, maybe we're, we're, we're we're discuss that offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can discuss it offline. Oh, but uh, sorry. Let you know, like, right. We've been yeah. definitely we're, we've been in touch with the district manager, and and uh, we're looking forward to sharing it with with CB nine. All right, all right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll thank you, do Teresa. What I can. Bye. And bye, bye, Dwayne. Go ahead. Final word. Um, actually, I wanted to you know uh, kind of gauge the committee's um feeling I think we still have enough people left, uh, enough board members left for considering a letter, a, a brief letter of support uh, with the caveats that we're asking around the bike lane and, and service road uh, conditions uh, for this particular item. Um, so I would one just, you know, need to just double check to see if we have a quorum, which I believe we still do. Um, Sarah, do that. How many I'm is quorum? I'll count. Yeah, I'm still not familiar with some of the new board member names, so forgive me, y'all. Um, uh, we have ten board members. I think that is sufficient. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, thanks, Joanne. Um, still so pass it on as a recommendation. We just wouldn't be able to vote on it if we don't have a quorum. Right. Um, so, I mean, someone would have to make the motion. I uh, motion that um, we write a letter of support, uh, including the caveats um, that were discussed here tonight uh, regarding the bike lane, service road, um, and some maintenance items. We'll review the video just to be to have some clarity. Yeah, and the comment about the rails. I mean, that's that's the that's about trucks and vehicles too, but the rails. Your comment about pedestrians, yes. but also the barriers. The barriers. Yeah, I think we'd have to. I think it would be sort of broader brush resolution because I think, you know, specific details like that would probably require a longer in depth discussion. Before. Yeah, we would have to look at a resolution after the summer, uh, a letter of a letter of support at the moment. Um, again, with the caveats around uh, the bike lanes and some of the safety concerns. Um, to be well, it's mainly to because consider. you said you're going before the PDC relatively soon. So we wouldn't have an opportunity to say anything whatsoever. So if we can craft something with which both the committee and the full board would be comfortable, uh, we're certainly going to make that effort and make it work for you. Liz, so, your comment? I, I just want to know. Wait, wait, wait. Just we, before we move wait, forward, just a matter of there's a motion on the floor uh, to, for us as a committee to um, support um, providing a letter of support, a vote in favor of providing a letter of support. Um, for this project, uh, with the concerns and caveats that have been uh, established here tonight, I'll uh, second. Do we have a second? Can I'm I sure amend the motion to make sure we include the education component as well? 
All right. So just for clarification, Joanne, do you want to restate your motion, including some of the amendments that have been requested? I'll restate the motion that um, <clears throat> this committee recommends a letter of support uh, with regard to this monument at the Parkside uh, Plaza uh, across the at the Parkside entrance of the, of the park. Um, with the caveats of the bike lane, um, uh, the bike lane, um, uh, sorry, uh, observation and what is the safest service roads, barriers, and the last one was the education component to make sure that we have that uh, on board. So restating the motion to include those two items, barriers and education component. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I'd, I'd like to put another friendly amendment in saying at least those to not make it look as if those are the only things that we've deemed important, but to say that we, you know, at the very least, we support this and these are our concerns at this time. I just don't want people to think that we've deliberated, you know, for a year on this and that's all we came up with. Uh, of course. Okay. So, you know, notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. So, Glenn, you second that, notwithstanding? Yes. Thank you. All right. So we have seconded by Glenn Woolman. So the committee will um, draft a letter of support uh, with the state of caveat. We'll go back through the video and just make sure we have that corrected. And, uh, you know, we will circulate that obviously to the committee members to ensure that we've captured everything. Uh, and then we will present it to our board um, on, oh goodness gracious, June 12th. Well, Dwayne, you, you got a, a proposal in a second, but you haven't. Wait, 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 wait. Sarah, do we have enough for a quorum? Do we know yet? Yes, at 10. We yeah. have 10 board Glenn, members. Glenn said yes. Yeah. Glenn is my de facto parliamentarian. So Glenn, am I missing a procedure, procedural thing here? Yes, yeah, so we have to poll the, the group that's here to make sure that you- Oh, yes, a, I'm so- <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> you Thank you for reminding me. Um, I tend to move a little faster than I should sometimes. Um, so uh, those in favor of um, the committee um, recommending a letter of support to the full board uh, or providing uh, recommending a letter of support to the full board um, in favor of this um, this uh, memorial um, with the, the state of caveats, um, raise your hand virtually or physically. Okay, got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven, twelve. All right, so I've got it looks to be for the members that are present a unanimous vote. So be it. Um, but just for the record, anyone in abstention or anyone, um, not in favor of this voting no all right wait let's take down hands folks uh nina your hand is still up is you can only vote once nina take your pick i think she left i'm sorry no i'm having a little i can barely hear so it's really hard for me to figure out what's going on i'm down my hand no is problem. gone i don't so know no hands in the negative and any and anyone needing to abstain from this vote. Okay, seeing no no hands in abstention, I uh, this vote or this motion carries. Uh, we will make the recommendation that uh, a letter of support be issued on behalf of uh, this particular topic uh, with the caveat and we will present that letter at the uh, June board meeting for uh, further discussion and approval of the full board. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to um, take us out, Dwayne? Uh, actually, I just want to make one quick announcement. Um, there was an update to our June meeting schedule. Um, we will be having on the 12th a public hearing uh, from a retail cannabis dispense for a retail cannabis cannabis dispensary application at 6.30 uh, prior to our board meeting at 7. Uh, just a reminder uh, that that board meeting is in person, which means that that public hearing will be in person as well. So again, we will, there's a, there was an amendment to the schedule for the month 
um, in just in case you missed it, um, there will be a public hearing uh, from an applicant uh, for a cannabis dispensary. Uh, it's a first one, uh, first legal one, <laughs> uh, uh, on June 12th at 6.30 uh, p.m. So we hope that you can join us for that. And Dwayne, do we also have that June 8th uh, presentation at Oma Park or? Um, forgive me. Yes, we, we do have, um, our next meeting will be, uh, well, it'll be a public hearing uh, on June 8th, uh, which we hope you guys can join us. It will be uh, the yes carbon neutrality, uh, the, the new proposed zoning tax amendment, um, as well as, uh, a design presentation from the folks at the uh, Uma Park Reconstruction. Um, I guess it's a task force. Um, so we hope you can join us for that. We're All busy right. bees over here. Very, very busy bees. I mean, we've got, if you haven't seen, please, you know, check the board's website for the new schedule, the upcoming, or the upcoming schedule for June. There's a transportation transportation meeting, forgive me, I suddenly can't speak, transportation meeting coming up on June 6th at 6.30, and that'll be online. So uh, please spread the word, participate in as many meetings as you can, and uh, we hope to see you all uh, next month um, in full swing until we so, close out the summer. So any old business? Any no. new business? Motion to adjourn, anybody? Motion. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All voting to approve. Thanks, everybody. Take care, y'all. Thanks for joining us. Have a us. great night. Bye, um, we'll see you guys in, in, in a couple of days for the next meeting. Okay. Good night. All right. Good, Good night, night, all. Good night. Thank you, Glenn.